Good evening. Well, good evening, everybody. I hope you uh, partake of the trick or treat stuff there on the table. <laughs> I don't get many of those at home, so I'm giving you the advantage. Oh, good for you. Thank, Thank you. you. May we have roll call, please? Yes. Commissioner Scott? Some good ones. Commissioner Compton? Here. Commissioner Rubis? Commissioner Hammond? Here. Commissioner Stevens? Here. Uh, Chairwoman Jaleski? Alternate Rotten? Here. Alternate Bacher? Here. Ms. Lee is on Greg Nani? Here. Council is on Edens? Yep, here. Council is on Farmer? Here. Okay. Does everyone get their minutes? Does anyone see any corrections that need to be made? Or is it Location for the location that have been presented to us. And Madam Chair, before we move forward, I don't know if you've all met Council oh, Member Joe Farmer. <coughs> and he was appointed to replace a vacancy that occurred on City Council. Mr. Taylor left. Mm -hmm. Mr. Farmer stepped up to the challenge and we appreciate it. Okay. Mr. Farmer, would you like to just give a little background? Um, yeah, I've been having some fun so far. I've been doing this for a little bit. Sorry I haven't been able to make it here. I've been double booked and also out of town. So uh, I'm excited to observe, I guess, is what I do here. So I'm happy to see what you guys have going on. I appreciate you all coming out and um, doing your part. I know that it's an undertaking. I'm learning that since I'm on a whole bunch of different things. But uh, it's good when people can come together to figure some things out. Thank you. Welcome aboard. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, in preparation of tonight's discussion, the Department of Planning prepared a memorandum uh, for the purposes of the members to use. I want to make clear at the start that the locations or those that we've talked about more casually or off the record, so to speak, than formally as part of a record or an intended action and the characteristics that form the table. As I mentioned in the memorandum, these are just some that came to Kathy and I's mind. There may be 20 more, there may be 200 more, or there may be enough, I don't know. So I wanna to emphasize tonight's discussion is just the first step. If there's um, other locations, We'll certainly go investigate those, add them to the matrix, and come back. If you have questions about the numbers, that's what Kathy and I are here for. But again, we're starting with those three locations that have been mentioned on and off ever since the SMO cabin was recovered, and the reconstruction became more of a reality again. Saying that, I know many of you got the opportunity to be up on the upper deck of the parking garage uh, when our consultant, Pattern and Eyes, was in town and all of the logs were delivered. They were um, reviewed, studied, um, investigated, and then the four elevations were set out onto the parking deck garage. The initial summary, I think, from the consultant is that we are missing some of the sharp logs that were placed between the windows. And obviously, the foundation and roof is no longer part of the, the reconstruction. But all in all, they thought we had enough to do it. And it wasn't as difficult as they thought it might be to reconstruct it into the the way the Essie Cat was before it was stolen. And so they tagged all of those and they're back in storage. And I hope you notice that storage has been kind to the logs. They have not degraded. 
we went to a property many years ago where someone was willing to donate logs and a cabin, and they were riddled with wood ants and termites and what have you. So uh, we've hopefully been doing a good job for you of preserving them. So the three locations um, are identified generally on a map that we provided to you. We took the liberty of, to use the points of interest map, which you all work on each year as part of our anniversary celebration. So the one that's farthest toward the top of the map, our north, is Community Park. The second is where we sit tonight at City Hall. And then finally the third is down in Glencoe City Park. And each of them are publicly owned property. So whatever choice might be made relative to these three or any other property owned by the city of Wildwood, we only need to have the permission of city council to proceed forward with the placement, reconstruction, and then ultimate use. So the first on our list <coughs> is city hall property. And although we've talked a great deal about the availability of an acre and a half of the original four acre tract of land that would be available, that was prior to the relocation of the community garden. So there's not as much property per se as there once was. And some of that property now does not lend itself very well to use because of slope past grading activity. So here at City Hall, if we assume we want to put it on an area of grass, we looked at the east side of the community garden. And this is representation there. And we looked at the west side of community garden. And this is near one of the access points. And that little tip of concrete you see is the trash enclosure if you leave tonight and want to have a point of reference. It's a wooded area, but as you can see, most of it is honeysuckle, invasive, and some of the other items, certainly. Um, not prime woodlands, but certainly they add to the character of the site. The next set of images, uh, one image is Glencoe City Park. And this is just to the northeast of the parking lot area. It's obviously open field. It does have some slope associated with it. It's not a flat site. But interestingly, this replicates more of the character of the land where the SM Log Cabin was before it was disassembled, stolen, and then recovered. That sat on a bit of the slope from the top down to Route 109. As we talked earlier, the Glencoe City Park site is also where we have the historic community marker placed. And so from the marker, if this location is considered acceptable, you would see the cabin. And from the cabin, obviously, you would see the marker. And there's proximity to parking and a very crude restroom facility, but there are services. And then finally is community park. So if you, if it was later in winter through that tree line, you would see the pavilion and the playground area. What separates the pavilion and playground area from the location that's identified in the photograph is Bottom Creek. So that wood line or woodland line is Bottom Creek for all intents and purposes. The asphalt surface at the, in the foreground is the park's interior road. And this is an area that's relatively flat. And you may think, well, Bottom Creek would be interesting because we have provided access to the creek from the playground area for kids. And they seem to take advantage of it quite a bit. But more importantly, I think the next photograph or slide I'll show you, this is what you would see as you were at the cabin looking out onto the Great Meadow area. Hopefully, minus the heavy equipment that's up in the corner there and the uh, road that the heavy equipment prepared created, 
getting access to the site. And so, from a, a photographic representation, that's just some quick um, ideas for you. You can certainly tour all the locations and any others that come to mind as part of tonight's discussion. The next item I wanted to go over, and then I'll conclude, and then we'll let you all as commission members take it from there. So, as I said, we've had a lot of informal conversations, and oftentimes we've talked about things like security, uh, visibility, historic community location, and so with that, Kathy and I created this list of seven characteristics. And so, obviously, you can read those access via roads and pedestrian facilities, visibility and setting, security, location assets, which is kind of a generic, but if you're at City Hall, you're closer to the businesses, so if you wanted to, you know, come here, see the City Hall, or have an event here at, at City Hall at, with where the cabin would be located, you could go get a cup of coffee, something like that. Land characteristics, woodlands, grades, floodplain, etc. Site improvements, including utilities, which is something we have to think about as well. Do we want electric to it, et cetera? Do we want to light it? Do we not? And then finally, is it in a con historic community or not? That was probably the easiest one to rank. Of the three, only one is, and that's at the Glencoe City Park. Um, so from that perspective, like I said. The assignment of numbers was something Kathy and I did, so I wouldn't say it was scientific in that we did quantum analysis and a supercomputer to come up with the numbers. <laughs> what we ended up doing is the lower the number, the less desirable, the higher the number, the more desirable. And just based upon our assessment, and you could do this after tonight at home, visit the site and the sites and assess them yourself. It looks like either Community Park or Glencoe City Park lent itself well. Saying that, if as commission members or collectively the commission, you believe security is paramount, then this, the decision is more straightforward. It's City Hall site, because the police park back there, the police are stationed here, and very shortly we'll have video cameras installed for the protection of all users and visitors to the site. So that's what we came up with on our initial brush. So from there, Madam Chair, we're all ears. Open for comments, questions. Joe, so it looks like the, the site improvements, utilities is really making the Glencoe site lower. Is that's still up in the air on whether that we even need utilities in the cabin, correct? Yes. So it, there are some there are some holes in the logic of the matrix because if we decide that the cabin didn't have electric when it was a cabin in historical times, do we sh why would we light it? Right. So the two things I looked at more so than anything was electric service and water. Those were the two. And Glencoe doesn't have any of that, right? It does have electric, but. No water. No water. Brian? Um, <clears throat> security is a, one of my highest um, concerns. However, um, the visibility and setting, you are giving it a very low score here at City Hall, mm -hmm. is not the property that was purchased for the Village Green contiguous to City Hall property. And once that is opened up and Crestview Avenue is opened up, the visibility is going to improve tremendously for that, for it to be here at City Hall. Um, the other thing that comes to my mind is that if it is here at City Hall, we would have access to all utilities. The building could then be used for early childhood programs, whatever, 
um, which in my mind would help to justify the cost of reconstructing it. So, short of any other place to put it, other than the three that are on this list right now, I guess my vote, which counts zero at this meeting, but <laughs> um, my vote would be to do it here at City Hall. I just, I just really worry about it being at one of the parks. I really do. Madam Chair, if I could just, um, the loan assessment on the visibility and setting relative to City Hall is a function of if we put it on a grass area, it's going to be next to a parking lot. And people park in the parking lot, so its visibility is reduced. And if we go to the east side of the City Hall site, what you see out, what I would consider the, probably the back side of the cabin, is the parking lot and detention area for the theater. So I did not include the six acre tract of land that's I, I assumed that you did not I, do that. Because I've been told that until we get through our process, we should make no assumptions about what's there or not there. And, and I agree, you know, and I understand that, I guess, from what I'm hearing about the assessments for what's going to happen, what is or is not going to happen at the Village Green, obviously we don't know anything yet, but my assessment of what the Village Green should be is basically an open area with very little, you know, it's not supposed to be a playground, it's not supposed to be a park, it's supposed to be a in my mind, it's supposed to be a place where we can hold the art fair, the movie nights, the concert nights. And so it basically needs to be a very passive place. And I think that lends itself well to, you know, maybe moving it over there a little, over that way a little bit, where it can be visible, but yet it's close to City Hall and it can be used as a meeting space, uh, you know, like I said, early childhood functions can happen there. Just, it, in my mind, that just makes a whole lot more sense than putting it in one of the parks. Yeah, Chris? For the community park in Glencoe City Park, um, obviously the community park right on bottom that's the that, other thing worry has about. That, has that flooded recently, especially with storms <coughs> in the past couple months? It's got a months? pretty big, deep okay. bank side, bank okay. there. On but that side. What about in Glen County <coughs> with the flooding in, what was it, 15 and 16? Did, did it make it up that far? No, sir. Okay. I, I like <coughs> the thought of a central location of City Hall. My other thought is, and I don't know that it, the the site suits it or, or it's big enough is this Route 66 State Park, or I'm sorry, uh, Route 66 Roadside Park that we were talking about. Um, that being said, we're talking about kind of a parking area and bike access, things like that. Um, but I like the central location um, of, of either City Hall or Route 66 State Park, or sorry, Route 66 Roadside Park. Um, my concern with Glencoe is I mean, there's obviously a lot of foot traffic down there and people go down there, but I, I don't know, I, I think having it close by lends itself to, to better usage. Um, my other thought with, with Community Park, though, is it's actually kind of closer to where it came from. So there's there's advantage to that, maybe. Ryan? Nope, Tamara, you first, or Dan? Joe, you know, one thing that kind of impressed me when I was looking at the logs, seems to be a very small building. I mean, very small. So when we're talking about how it can be used and what we can do with it and where we put it, give us all a feel for what we're talking about. Just, you know, how, how long, how wide, Ooh, how many say, square feet? I would say it was basically, 
I was in it when it was on the Karst property off of Route 109. When they made the initial offer, we visited it, it with the family. I want to say, at most, it was 20 by 20, so about 400 square feet. So it's, it's a pretty small building. So, so as far as where it goes in that regard, it would probably fit anywhere. What we used it for would be suspect in size. But I think I kind of agree that if we can keep it centralized and keep an eye on it, it would be a bad thing. I guess my only other question was, could it be incorporated into the village green? But I know that's a whole other game. And certainly, as the Historic Preservation Commission, you can weigh in on that issue. You have as much right as the Parks Action Plan Update Committee, the Planning and Zoning Commission, um, because you're part and parcel of the decision-making process. So any of the sites that you've mentioned, whether it's the Route 66 roadside park or the Village Green area, we can add that to the table and then do the analysis and at least make it all inclusive. I don't think we should take anything off right now. Can I just have a quick question for Ms. Edens? The, um, for City Hall, you're talking about right out back here, right? Ooh. At least in these pictures. I like the village green idea. Mr. Hammond, I, you know, the front is, doesn't lend itself well because it's primarily concrete. Yeah, yeah, and, no, absolutely. And so we kind of have to work our way back. And like I said, at one time we had an acre and a half, but we used about a half acre of that for the benefit of the community garden. Yeah, um, I am concerned about the proposal for where it would be located at City Hall because I, I do think, again, low visibility, unless you're driving up in that parking lot, you may not discover it, whereas if you're driving through another park with your children, you're, you're going to see it. And Community Park, at, at least, is very highly trafficked. Um, I don't think that there should be any electricity in the cabin. I don't think it's necessary. Now, what you can consider is spotlighting it at night from the outside. I think that would help security as well. But um, when we talk about preserving history, we don't, we don't need to make changes like that. I don't think it affects the way that we would display it. Um, Foss Park is a great example. Um, you, you know, when they want to do historic walkthroughs of their cabins, you know, there's a, either a fire outside or there's candles, and, and um, I think that would be the appropriate way to teach children. So that, uh, but where, wherever it is, it probably should be spotlighted outside. And the only water consideration is maybe how close it is to a fire hydrant in case it bursts into flames. But. Um, I like the village green idea. Um, I know from some other committees how concerning and how far out that could be in terms of timetable. Um, that's kind of all I can say about that, um, just from closed session. But I'd, I'd, I'd like it to be central. I'd like to consider village green, but I don't like it behind City Hall. I just don't think it's visible enough from the road. So if if the village green would be off the table indefinitely and you want to get it done sooner than later, I would lean towards community park if the creek is not likely to flood it. Madam Chair, if I could, um, Kathy, when do we expect the report from Pattern and Knives, the architectural firm? They haven't given me a time frame, but they're working on it currently. I would expect it before our next meeting. So let's just assume we meet in November and then we're kind of done for the year given the calendar and the holidays. We probably won't have the report available to all of you for high scrutiny until the first of the year, let's say. And then from there, we've got to go to the next step, which is the bid specifications and, and et cetera. So I guess what I'm saying is, is the village green might actually a decision may be made long before we're ready to reconstruct the cabin. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the bad news too is, in 2020 in the capital improvements program, the department did not set aside any money for the reconstruction. It's a bit of a lean year, and we had to kind of step back from a lot of projects and look out more on a three to four year program. So maybe it's not going to even be start to be built till 21, right? 
at the earliest, I would say. So I think we have time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you want to include Village Green, I think we could do that. I so. think, too, that there could be potential, and you know a lot more about this than I do, that if it's thought of as a significant adder to the Village Green, it could potentially get incorporated into that budget. Well, certainly if this group says, we have two sites we like, Site X and the Village Green, the consultant uh, is given the charge to come up with come up with the preliminary design. That information will be provided to them. Only yeah. concern, um, or not really concern, but factor. Um, we can't move into phase two with the construction drawings being complete until we have a location selected. It's going to impact some of the, the obviously the engineering and construction. So. But if, if it takes us a year to pick the location, then we move into construction and to engineering drawings at that point. Or you make an assumption that what they do is flexible enough to go pretty much on a semi-flat area. Kind of, but they've said, Pattern and Pattern and I have said, I mean, that's not my area of expertise, but they said before they would finalize phase two, which is the actual biddable drawings, we have to have a location selected. Wildwood. <laughs> <laughs> a little closer. Right? <laughs> Just a little closer. <laughs> not knowing anything about how that works, I mean, how, how much more difficult is it for them if you give them two locations and you say, you know, what difference does it make between these two, you know, how much difference in cost does it make between these two places or whatever, or how much more sure. difficult is one than the other? I'm sure they're concerned with grading for the foundations right. and all that, and they don't want to do that on a severe slope. We but can everything, the two parks. But they could do that, yeah. probably. Lincoln's a pretty good hill. Mm -hmm. Community park is flat as a pancake. Right, so and up here would be. The engineering and the foundation and footings are going to be. 180 degrees different. Yeah, on right, right. But if we're if we're yeah. considering community park versus city hall, how much difference is there going to be between those two two locations? Because they're both pretty level, are they not? Particularly the village green. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you paying for an extra drawing? Yeah. On two or extra site survey or something. Right. Did I know we talked about it in committee, and I think we did voted to proceed with it, but I think everybody got really busy. Did we ever officially apply for the Barnwood Builders show to see if they would cover the costs? They weren't accepting applications. Oh no. Yeah, and it's, um, there's a private, so it's a, you know, it's an actual company that right. they use and they did not have any, um, I'll, I can double check back on their site, but they weren't, the, the show wasn't accepting any. <coughs> A lot of cabins around there. They're rebuilding. Right, and the barn with builders site. They were happy to um, give you a price. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. I mean, I didn't. I didn't reach out because I. It, it looked like it was gonna, you know, put us in this loop of sales pitch. But um, we can, you know, when we get a little closer, I think we can try and see. And if they think it's a pretty unique story. Yeah, I was gonna say if we tweeted it and made it social media. Our barn was, or our cabin was stolen. That's so unique to lead with that. Could we make a motion to add the green to the matrix and see where it shakes out? Certainly, if there's no objection from Madam Chair, that could. I'll second. Second. Everyone in favor? We were, I'm sorry, we were trying to get the maker of the motion into the minutes. Did we vote? Yeah. Okay. I assume there was no objection. No. Have you, though, for the, Brad was talking about the security issue. Have you uh, had security issues at Community Park with what's there now? Or we're just assuming that since the cabin was stolen once before or burned down or something, that you could have the same type of issue, right? Glencoe Park presents more of a challenge. I think so too. Park. And it's kind of far out of the way, like we talked about. You know, Community Park might be the best other than this Village Green, you know. Uh, community Park, um, not so much any vandalism or graffiti. 
we just have a lot of a after hours activities there and uh, the police try to address it but we've been fortunate today at community park or glico park community, community park, park. Cool. yeah with the road open all the way through does that pose more of a problem now for the after hours it depends um, gives better access to the police, but it also gives a way, a secondary way for people to get out. So um, I don't know. That's a good question for the police department. And I, but obviously if security is, is a major concern, which it seems to be from what I'm hearing, then I think the city hall site and Village Green will probably uh, will rise to the top eventually. Can, can we see the matrix? Could we, does it make sense, and I'm asking the team, to maybe add an eight and call it traffic or call it visits or people? Or, in other words, what I'm trying to get at is how would you rank the number of people in a year that would be visible to the cabin? What would you call that? Visits to visits. the Visit to the visits to the park. Yeah. Something like that. You can add that, sir. Does that make sense? How would you Yeah, is that good or bad? Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> it, it, is not, it good? Not, not necessarily that, but how I mean how do you number visits to the city hall? Because people are coming Exactly. Yeah, and f and for what reason, as opposed to the people that come to come guess, to the park? And I just think that, yeah, I don't know. I think you call it potential exposure. At least the people are going to be at the Village Green, or at least the people are going to be at City Hall. At least the cabin's going to be in proximity where the most people are going to be yeah. most of the time. And, and That's that, what I'm trying to get. Right. That could and, be number two, though, right? Dan? I yeah. Mean, why isn't that visibility in the city? Could be. Because mm, if you get it, if you get it in the Village Green and you and you get the concerts and everything going on there, you're going to have thousands. And maybe yeah. that's good exposure. And I, that's and I agree. And that's one of my reasons for saying mm. that it should be up here near City Hall, this this side of the Village Green. You know, on the uh, utilities, if I. Growing up in the electrical business, I agree with uh, Miss Eads. Is I don't think there needs to be electricity in the cabin. I think you can light the the outside of the building with solar, so that you don't have a lot of wires running all over the place either. And then as long as you had water close by, I'm not sure you need much. So you wanted to do like Fran was saying, you could always do uh, get rent a small generator and hook up portable lights if they needed something like that, or use the typical like they used years ago. You know. The lanterns or something too, but I don't see it being rewired. Not a 400 square foot spot. I mean, that's only about twice as big as a hotel room, so it's not very big. It is not. I can assure you, when we were in it. Now it is two. It was two stories. Mm -hmm. Is it still going to be? That's a good question, and one will ask the architectural firm to advise us of what. I didn't see a lot of blocks. <laughs> yeah, you have to get the some floor for the <laughs> flooring. Roofing joists, the roof, the foundation, gone. So that'll all be um, new materials, hopefully old new materials that we can repurpose. We also have to stretch away those capital. Based on what you know as far as accessibility and potential legal issues, is it something that we would want people trapped or is it something that you I can look at it, but I can't go in it, kind of thing. That's a, that's a great point, one I didn't think of. So I'm going to add that to my, I'll have an answer for you. I don't have a good one right now. I think you have to then start thinking about potential uses for it, right? Mm -hmm. Are you going to furnish it with period specific right. thing, or <laughs> does it become a classroom, or does it like, mm -hmm. We can meet there. Not if there's no lights, but <laughs> we can get you some yeah. lights. <laughs> we can get lights. 
But uh, yeah, they had school like kids come out and had a, had a class in there or something like that. But you know, a history class would be kind of neat. So I think there's could be quite a substantial usage for that, for something like that. Security is a big deal too, but I'm sure behind the city hall is going to be the best spot for security, you know, up in this area. The, um, the cabin we all visited off of Bottom Creek, uh, Overbrook. Overbrook Farm. Mm -hmm. Was it, did it have lighting in it? I don't remember. Did he have lights that we turned no. on when we were walking through it? Yeah, or was in it? the house he did, but yeah, I don't yeah, know yeah. what he's going to have now. I know that it is the cabin, right, so the, 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 the log cabin the is completely yeah. exposed now. Yes. Yes, but as you know, like a lot of the cabins in Wildwood, they built houses around mm -hmm. sure. and added electric and other utilities for service. But we'll look at we'll look at a couple of these things we've talked about: exposure, potential, accessibility from an ADA standpoint, and we'll also talk about the use profile. What do you all want? It, what do you want it to be when it grows up? When it grows up, I I know that Mr. Compton has told me in the past that he would like it to be. Mr. Scott, I'm sorry. Yes, Mr. Scott. <laughs> I always get you two mixed up, and no, I, don't I don't know do why. I that, you know. My hair's <laughs> um, not quite as right, gray no, as it is. No, it's not. <laughs> um, and I don't think you're quite as old as you <laughs> see. No, get there. <laughs> um, has, has said that he would like to see a whole village of houses hmm. accrue to this, and I guess I don't see us going there. He's um, after a Cape's Cove, like yes, in, uh, or like the Smokies thing, or, or something or like, like that. Or like Faust Park. Or what Faust is doing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, We're going to have up a yeah, few dollars yeah. to do that I, with me. Yeah, and a lot of space, too. <laughs> a lot of space, too. Right? That would take up the whole village green and then some. But, um, I mean, I don't know. I just I just think it would be nice if it could be used. And I, and I don't necessarily mean, you know, to electrify the whole thing with lights and you know fluorescent lights on the ceiling and all that but to have maybe a little bit of electricity in there so that if you did want to hold a meeting you you could do that or if you wanted to have an early childhood program you could do that in a reasonable fashion without having to rent a generator for the day or whatever so i don't know we'll let the architect tell us what they think this is their specialty depending upon occupancy would have a significant impact on cost. Yep. Whether sprinklers and all that. Yeah, you gotta be That's careful. True. Yeah. With you, of course you're not gonna get 150 people in a 400 square foot spot, so you're hmm. probably okay on sprinklers. But I think that's the break off. Maybe a five gallon. <laughs> <laughs> some buckets outside, yeah. <laughs> Kathy, how many people are usually at an early childhood program? 25, 30? 25 children, yeah. plus yeah. caregivers. Yeah, so total 50. 50 people. That's a, be a good thing, like Cub Scout meetings. Just mm -hmm. be good for a scout not, not they meet there on every month, basis, but mm -hmm. for, yeah. for a special meeting. Yeah, it'd be good yeah. for that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. At least we're talking about it, right? All right well, we'll update the matrix. We'll add some additional items, and we'll see if we can answer a few of your questions. Cool. So hopefully we'll have this back to you in November with a refined uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Everyone's comments are very valuable. Uh, discussion regarding a tribute to uh, Lisa Kelp. Thank you again, Madam Chair. Uh, as you know, at the start of 2019, one of our work program items was some type of memoriam or memorial action for Lisa Kelp. For those that may have not known Mrs. Kelp, she was very active in the Wildwood Historical Society. Also, uh, I've been a very long time resident of the Wildwood area. Her husband, Tom Kelp, and his family obviously have been out here for generations. She was uh, killed in an automobile accident approximately uh, two years ago. And so we've made little progress on this particular item. So Kathy and I thought 
maybe instead of trying to do something very grand, maybe we could start with something a little bit more um, smaller in nature, but certainly within that process of a recognition. So the thought was is potentially putting um, a, a Tabor brick out of Old Pond School in the um, patio area of the entry into the facility. As you can see, some of the lighter colored uh, pavers are those that have been purchased by others in recognition of either being a student at the facility, having a relative that's been a student at the facility, someone that participated in the restoration, etc. The larger pavers are $250, the smaller ones are $100. So as, a, as the city, we could certainly afford to do that if that's something you believe is appropriate. Conversely, if you all wanted to chip in, including staff, we could do something like that and purchase one and for her, in tribute to her from the Historic Preservation Commission. The Is other um, item we identified. Oh, the website. <coughs> So that was the initial thought. Um, and I think Kathy had a good suggestion as well. And we've had a lot of others like Mr. Thompson, who was a member of the commission past recently, plus Judy Saum, who was involved in the incorporation effort, was on the commission. Maybe we need to come up with a protocol or a process where if someone does pass this, that has had a role in historic preservation, particularly here on the commission or with the society, maybe we have something in place already that each time we are a little bit more prepared and then we can address it a little quicker and um, hopefully uh, uh, make the family and others feel like you know, the city did us right. So that's what we're proposing tonight. And we're certainly um, more than willing to accept other ideas. Um, but we think maybe a paver at Old Pond School and then doing something on our website to recognize all of those people that have served the, the city from a historical preservation perspective, doing something that uh, kind of memorializes them on the website forever. How about a memorial flagpole in one of these locations? seen it in the past, like take the school for example, you could have the United States flagpole and around that flagpole would be the memorial to the people that we're talking about. Well, uh, Old Pond School has a flagpole. It's in a landscaped area at the front of the building. We have a flagpole that's been sitting out on the west side of the garage for probably uh, 10 years. We have one. Um, so it's up to you all. There is a cost, a greater cost. Um, so it's something I need to know before the budget gets finalized this year. There, yes, we also have benches and we also have memorial trees that we offer. Along those lines, <coughs> I don't think I've seen any. Do, we don't have, are there any benches along the, the bike paths that are dedicated? In Wildwood, I know other, I know I see it like on the Katy Trail. Do we have any along the bike paths here in town? Typically, we place them. Well, the Rock Hollow. Rock there's Hollow. A, yeah, there's a bunch in those little alcoves as you go. Oh, down yeah, the that's Rock right. Hollow, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. There's a, a, a number of those are dedicated. Um, there's a few dedicated around Community Park, but kind of near the playground. Yeah. But on the trail. Yeah. So there are a few. So 250. How much is a bench? A thousand, about eleven $1 hundred dollars. Okay. Just understand. I like the idea of the, of the brick. The memorial brick sounds like a good direction to be headed. Whether that eventually becomes a bench or something else, at least it gets us moving in the right direction to do something for them. How much of a precedent are we setting in doing it for? her versus others in the community. 
We did a brick for Judy Sum. She was a former commissioner, right. um, and when she passed, we put we ordered one for her. At Pond School? The, mm -hmm. the, the big one or the little one? I think the big one, but I don't really, I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. That's cool. I mean, I, don't, I guess I don't have a problem with doing something for Lisa. Um, however, Mr. Thompson and Judy were both members of this commission. Lisa, as far as I know, never was. Um, so, you know, I think maybe whatever we did for Judy, we should do for Larry. Um, you know, if we want to do maybe, you know, I, I mean, if we did a small one for them, we do them, we can do a small one for her, but if we did a big one for Judy, we do a big one for Larry, and, and we, you know, maybe do a small one for Lisa, I don't know, maybe a big one. I don't really have a feel totally for that, but because she never was, although Tom has done a lot for the city, I know, I mean, some of what she's gotten paid for and some of what she has not. So, you know, I think we, we do do something for her. And, and I, I would agree with maybe doing the, the stuff on the website. I think that's probably think a good idea. idea that doesn't really cost anything. Some and time. it has maybe a good visibility. Right. Where how many go to Pond School to see the papers? Right. Lauren, you had something? Yeah, is it possible, and bouncing off of what Dan said, whether it's out in front of a flagpole or not, but to do some sort of monument's not the right word, but I'm thinking of like a granite slab tilted at an angle with a pillar underneath it, and then either. Um, you know, they do the cast bronze with like the oil rubbed finish that's um, cast or just etched into granite, you know, some sort of um, mission about those, of, statement about those that were lost that helped with historic preservation and there's no other way to phrase it but etch names or cast them and continually add to the list. So that it's standing with free space to just add more names and they're all in one place because now you're going to have a paver here, something else here, another paver here, and it adds up that this, this would all be together and maybe more cost effective in the long run. You're like the Vietnam Wall. Yeah, I didn't want to say it, but, <laughs> but maybe with a different look, but, but the same idea is that right. we all get added to the same place. And a, pro sometime. a process that's documented. Okay, so are we going to have a place to memorialize people? Yes, but okay. How do you get your name in that space? And I think you probably need to finalize a mm -hmm. process, whether it's a simple form that somebody fills out. I recommend Adam Smith for the position, blah, 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 for his dedication to go through a review process. It may even be this committee that reviews them says, yeah, we think that they should be there. No, we don't think they should be there. Sort of like the Wall of Fame that a lot of yeah. places have, um, where you have an application that's filled out. And exactly. You give all the qualifications of the person. So. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, so you, so it's not hit or miss. There's, there's right. no process and it's go fine. Well, I mean, I don't know where Judy's brick is. I, don't, I think I found it at one time, but I don't remember. I mean. You could put all the in memoriam bricks for people that have keep them all together in a group on the ground because I know there are a lot. There's a lot of space there where none of the bricks are are they're just plain bricks. Mm -hmm. Memorial, right. memorial garden. You could even get like this section where it's delineated different. You know, we could look at doing a a brick or a couple of small bricks that are a title, like in memoriam, or, you know, our historic wildwood people passionate about historic preservation or something, and then including all the bricks within that delineated area. Right.
Any other comments or questions? So, Madam Chair, in response to Mr. Rodden's discussion points, do you want us to come up with a process and an application first before we make a decision on Ms. Kelp or others, Mr. Thompson, et cetera? Or, again, the reason this is before you is it was added to the work program, so we want to be respectful of the commission's work program. But if you'd like us to do the front end work, create the process, and see how it plays out, then we can certainly do that. Any comments on that? I think it happened pretty quick. I mean, we could, in the next meeting, we could say, here's the process, and here's three nominees. We could pass them around and say, you're here, man, let's start. Theoretically. That's nice. There's no so objection. We would appreciate you coming up with some okay. format that we can maybe clarify in the meantime. <laughs> Kathy will get on it right away. Good job, Kathy. Sorry, I couldn't pass it. <laughs> I'm glad uh, I hired you back. She had the gavel. <laughs> Richard Compton's a bad influence. If she, if, she, if she had the gavel, she could have stopped the meeting before he said that. <laughs> I had a session. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll try to have something back for your review in November. Thank you. And we move on to the annual report, which uh, looks like a lot of work on someone's part to get that all yeah. together. The good news is, y'all do such great work that each year it's pretty darn easy to write the annual report that gives highlights of what we've covered. Uh, so this is, the annual report is a requirement um, of being a CLG, and so I, this is just the draft. If you see anything and have any comments or changes, please let us know. Um, a bunch of it is unchanged. in. You know, we keep history in history, so we don't always make those changes um, that are unnecessary. But beginning on page six, there's a few things I'd like to call your attention to. Um, we do have to submit biographies of, or you know, explain your, how you're related in the preservation fields and your interests and, and the like. So any current member who was on the previous years, their biography is listed. I didn't update these, so if you could read your own and make sure it's still accurate that you know you didn't, I don't know, find you know, some major historic relic this year and we need to add that. Um, and if you're new, uh, if you could provide me with a, um, your bio within the next week or two, um, that would be great and I can get that submitted off. Um, including us? Including you. Oh, okay. yep. Thank you. Just checking. Um, some of the highlights on page 11, we got to and if you don't, it gives us liberty to create the product. <laughs> That's right. I'm sure it probably will not be as nice as the one you provide. We need to write what we think about you, know, what you're saying, not what so you are. It's a darn shame we already have one for Mr. Yeah, right. You have multiples, right? Just depending right. on okay. what the mood is. Sorry, Madam Chair. That's all right. <laughs> Uh, just some of the highlights. On page 11, we got to add Mary Cliff as one of you know, our newest Definitely. on the local registry. Um, and then we added, you know, on pages kind of 13 through 18. Those are the big things that, that you all have done. So if you want to read through those and um, if there's anything you feel that we missed or you want to mention, like I said, just let me know. Um, and then on page 19, we have a solid block of training, I feel like, this year. We doubled her volume of training from last year, I think. Um, and Joe and I are working on providing another training. I, it probably won't be this year, but we felt like we had enough for this annual report, <laughs> so we're going to offload it to the next year. Um, and we'll be talking about that in our meeting, our next meeting, which is actually December. We don't have a meeting in November. So, That's right. Thanksgiving is late this year. My yeah. apologies. Yeah. So we bump it to um, the first Thursday in December, just so y'all for your calendars. And then we don't meet, obviously. Although we'd love to see y'all on Christmas. I miss Stephen's fun candy on Halloween just because we've been at Christmas. We want to get gifts. Maybe we'll change that. I think that. I think that. 
Anyway, we have, um, like I said, we have the, the training and some of the public education things that we do. So I just need the bios, and if you have any other comments or um, suggestions on that, we'd love to hear them. I'm happy to answer any questions on the reports. Any questions? most pressing about the certified local government annual reports, including the buyers of the four members. I believe Mr. Gave us one. Yep. So we have one of the four we need. Um, that's critical. And please, if you have the time, particularly the activities of the commission, if you could go through those, I think it'd be real beneficial just there's a reinforcement of what we do, and although it may not be the most flashy stuff sometimes, we are making a lot of progress. And in terms of training, one of the things we're, we're looking at is, as you know, and if you attended the event at Big Chief Roadhouse, the folks from Route 66 Association were there. I talked to them about coming and doing a presentation and training. and. Uh, they were more than happy to do that. And so I think that'll be probably what we kick off our new year with training wise is a presentation from them. And Kathy, I know I've, I've talked to you in the past about the historical societies meetings. And I understand just, you know, a regular meeting or if they have someone, you know, who has written a book who is not, you know, a, authority on a subject, that not counting, but, and I unfortunately didn't get to the meeting because there was a conflict, but I mean, they've had people from the, his, the Missouri Historical Society there giving talks. Would those not count? I think depending on the topic, okay. they would. Um, it has to be, it has to relate to what we do in Wildwood. So if it's on something in the city and it's, some historical thing there, probably not. Okay. Um, but if it's Route 66, if it's some more general or generic historic preservation effort, then it would. Okay. I know there's a gentleman coming in November, um, but that'll be on our next annual report if anyone attends that one, and I think that one would count. Okay. And Maybe I that's the no one I'm one thinking from, of. Uh, from SHPO is watching because I'm just going to say that we're going to put it down on our training anyway. Okay. Until they tell us. That doesn't count. Okay. So I think okay. that any way that we're growing our knowledge in historic preservation is a plus, and I don't see how that's just yeah. a detriment. Yeah. I, I just don't. I, I think that the teacup meetings are what conflict with their meetings. I think they're on the same night, if I'm not mistaken. So. Well, we will finish that one. <laughs> <laughs> <We're eventually too. laughs> But if you do attend any of okay. those, just send them to me. And okay. if, you, if you attend anything, um, if you if you go and they have a little flyer or you find a description on the website or something, just send it to me so I can you okay. know, add it to our thing. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Like I said, until they tell me no, I'm going to go ahead and do it. That's good. So it looks like we're down. Um, all business update on the work program. So, Madam Chair, just before we leave the CLG, Kathy will send a reminder to the three remaining commission members while just reminding you and giving you the time frame we need to buy those back. So, by Wednesday. By Wednesday. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, so our work program, we're getting down to the wire here for 2019. And uh, I propose a new category for 2020 that's ongoing because I love checking things off the list and underway to me feels like we didn't finish it, but some of these we won't ever actually finish. Um, so the first are just our two items that we haven't started. Um, the first is the, again, the installation of the historic community marker. We're still blaming this on public works. They haven't started the bridge yet, so we can't put in the community marker. It'll always be their fault, by the way. I'm going to tattletale the public works. <laughs> <laughs> I just tell them the things. I mean, I'm not really shy about it, but I'm sure that's our new event. Um, and then the other is our master plan that we want to create um, so that we can act 
proactively instead of reactively when people um, want to donate different items to the, to the city. So our eight items underway are Bellevue Farms, which you all took action on last month, um, and that is, it was actually at the Zoning Commission this past Monday, and they approved, I believe, and it's now, um, we'll go to City Council as a receive and file next Monday. So that's making pretty significant progress um, in the, the more simplified design. We just started the tribute to Lisa Cal this evening. Um, number six is preserve, encouraging preservation through a number of our different um, outlets. I've made a number of updates to the website, although not as many as I'd like to, but we have updated with the points of interest map, the book this year, um, and a few other items that we, that we have out there. As we noted, our training has improved greatly this year. Um, got some more uh, on the horizon for next year. Looking through the reassembly of the SM Log Cabin. Route 66 promotion is one that we're still still working on. We had, we had talked earlier in the year about um, a sign company that Joe and I had gone down to their offices and met with them. And it seems that they're extremely busy and we're really struggling with getting back any um, information from them. So we're likely going to look at a different route for Route 66 signage um, and, and bring that back in the next couple of meetings. Um, we did make one progress. I think I even forgot to tell you, so this will be news to him as well. Um, the, there's a, a, a organization called Adventure Bicycling and they have maps. They make routes all over the country for um, different bicycle routes that have different features and elements. Well, Route 66 is one of their routes, and it's from Chicago all the way to California. And um, it goes, so it does go through Wildwood. And um, we contacted them to see if we could feature their map for the portion of Route 66 through Wildwood on our Parks and Recreation app. And they said we could, and they sent us, they're sending us the file, um, the format I got didn't work. So we're working through that with them. But that'll be a kind of a nice, and we'll give them a little promo in the app and the details on that trail. But that'll be a nice um, addition there. So We're working on expanding our social media efforts. We actually have a meeting, myself, um, Travis Newberry, our planner who attended last month, and um, Debbie Ward, a social media expert that we're working with, we'll actually be meeting next week and historic preservation, we're gonna make monthly calendars and, and really up the city's social media efforts and historic preservation is on there. We'll, you'll start seeing a lot more um, of those posts. And then finally on our items that are underway are our three um, free construction projects. And the first is Manchester Road Streetscape. It's a little like Afghanistan if you've driven down the street lately and that's Missouri American Water is upgrading their lines and then um, relocating their pipes. So they are the final utility that needs to do work um, along that route. And then we'll get started on the rest of that construction project. State Route 109 is actually on track. Um, they're still on the time frame that they set, even with all the rain this year. They're working on finishing the western um, deck and they've um, made significant progress on the tunnel and some of the walls and things around it. And then finally, Community Park Phase 3 is almost complete. The bridge will be delivered next week, but the um, contractor has installed the pavilions, they planted the rain gardens, the trail is paved and in. Um, so once we get the bridge set, which will be a pretty actually neat process, um, that project will be complete. And then I'll have to end on a high note. So the last thing are the five that we've completed. So the display banner, the WPA wall repair, Old Pond School, points of interest map, the bylaws, and then the next chapter in our history. And I'll end with one final note. When we had the, um, the brick contractor out at Old Pond School to do the tuck pointing on the WPA wall, we noticed that um, the back side of the wall was getting too much water from the plantings. And so um, and it was going actually in the wall and through the top and causing some damage. So we, uh, he came back out and capped the entire length of the wall. Now the interesting part is 
this slide here is before the cap was put on, and this is after, and you almost can't see it. Okay. So unless you're on top of it looking right down at the stairs or here, this is before and this is after. And obviously you can see because I'm at a different angle. Um, but we just thought you did a really nice job on um, adding that feature to protect the wall but not really changing the character. Um, Baxter Gardens will be out in the next couple of weeks and we're going to change up. Um, they're going to put in some drainage and, and, and change up some of the plantings along the top of the wall to uh, help preserve the wall as well. So. We irrigate the front lawn area so there's a source of water consistently and it's infiltrating down and that's what's causing the freeze thaw or exacerbating the freeze thaw during certain parts of the year and just rain during the other. So capping it and draining it will probably preserve the wall longer if we did not do that. That's very nice. Yeah, thank you. That's all I have. I'm happy to answer any questions. Could we have a meeting there, one of our meetings there, sure. during sometime in the spring? Sure can. Mm -hmm. Nice suggestion. After, after, after the winter is over. <laughs> it's a little chilly in there in the wintertime, even with the heat. Absolutely. Although it's chilly here sometimes. Yeah, too. that's true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the second item, I believe we are postponing for the current time, and that's the uh, bicentennial celebration that we had talked about earlier. Our apologies, we, Kathy and I ran out of time this week, so we do apologize. Discussion on archiving documents. Not ready for action, but anyone have any questions about it or comments? Well, I would note that Ms. Greg Nani and Ms. Kozlowski, Kat Kozlowski, have been kind of going through different sources of information, sources being individuals that have collected newspaper articles, other items about the incorporation reached a point where they're hoping for a few of us to go look at them, particularly Kathy and I, to see what they've done today. If you'd like to maybe give a little detail. Um, yes, we went, we've gone through Mrs. Kozlowski mostly. I've helped her some, but she has done a lot on her own. Her husband, as you know, was the chair of the Committee for the Incorporation, and an engineer and he had lots and lots of boxes filled with lots and lots of documents. Um, and then we had stuff from Mrs. Sam, stuff from Sue Cullinane, um, and a couple other people. Um, but we've whittled it down. There's probably or 12 boxes of documents. We've took out a lot of duplicates. Um, we have a lot of newspaper articles and have come up with, and I didn't bring it with me tonight, but we actually found th three to five timelines or histories or, you know, just sequence of events that have been written over the years. So there's some fairly decent starts. And then obviously there was the one that Mr. Kennedy wrote for the 20th anniversary of the incorporation. So there's a lot of information there that, there's a lot that won't need to be archived, but, but probably should be kept. Um, but there is a lot of information to get started and a lot of newspaper articles and the little political like cartoon type things that appeared in various sundry papers during the incorporation effort. So there will be a lot of things that can be used in the next and final chapter, I guess, for the 
for the history book, so. so we need to, someone needs to come out and look and see what they want, and you know, I think we can find or <coughs> provide a lot of information for, for writing the next chapter. Thank you for doing that. Has any thought been given to where these will all be stored? I can tell you where they will not. <laughs> That will not be City Hall, we're out of the room. So, yes, and log cabin. <laughs> <laughs> Basement of the yes and log cabin. Right, right, <laughs> right now, I think the plan is that Mrs. Kozlowski is going to keep it in her basement with some sort of notification on the top of it that if she is no longer with us, where it should go, but I don't know exactly who that's going to be yet, but she's got room in her basement and is willing to keep it, she said, for a while. Mr. Koslowski had given the documents to the city when he was alive, and we had stored them at Old Pond School, but Old Pond School isn't the best location either, just because it is cold in the winter, and it's a little hot and it's susceptible to humidity, which affects the documents, particularly newspaper articles. So the city uses Dodge storage to archive its records that were required to keep forever. Mm -hmm. And they have a system of identifying those records and then they can pull them up pretty quickly. And then we've been scanning and archiving most of our documents, our planning and zoning and other land use items um, since we got our new copier recently so but we do want to look through those because our next chapter in our history book is about the corporation and, and the past 20 years I guess my only question in regards to the writing of that chapter is I know that that the Historical Society has said that they do not want to write that chapter. It's my understanding. Actually, they weren't given the opportunity to write that chapter. Right. I think that should stay closer to home. And, and I would agree, but I guess the one, and, and I don't know how to handle this, but the next, the, the one, prob, one concern, I guess, that I have is that if it's written by someone else is it's going to look or sound completely different than the rest of it unless we can figure out some way to kind of mesh the styles um, and I the other along with that is that in some regards and, and I guess I don't know any other way to say this than to just come out and say it is that there are a lot of people at the Historical Society who were on the opposite side of the fence to the people who were on the side of the fence that wanted the city incorporated. And it may be that someone at the history, maybe Jill, should write, you know, a point of view from that side also. That's true. Well, there's a cost to have this fine group. And I understand offer. that, right. A, a, a two chapters. Two chapters. <laughs> right. Um, so, and that's not part of the contract that we have with Fred Curry right at this moment. I feel comfortable, let's say, creating the incorporation chapter, and if Ms. Von Grubman wants to edit it so as it contains a consistent theme with the other chapters that have been authored by her. I think that's reasonable. Okay. And then as the commission, which has had oversight of all the chapters, can then review it to ensure that they think it does the justification and has that consistent um, language. I think that's the approach that okay. I'd like us to And, and that sounds fine. But, you know, I, I really do kind of think that there should be, I mean, it's, 
the the opposition to the incorporation is just as much as part of the history as the incorporation itself. Well, to me, a well-written chapter on the incorporation will include both sides. Okay, and we and we do have some information in there of concerns that people that were in opposition had and the answers from the incorporation side to their concerns. So you may, there may be enough in there to, to cover that. I mean, in past times, history has been written to promote a particular outcome, I think. And more recently, I think history has taken an approach Good history is one that represents all the facets. So I don't see us not writing a chapter on incorporation that doesn't speak to the fact that although the vote was favorable, there was still 3,000 people, in my recollection, in terms of the number that didn't support it. And we'd do an injustice if we didn't at least identify why. Right. That's where we are. I think the newspaper articles will be beneficial to that. Mm -hmm. As there's some of you may not know or are knows, Post Dispatch came out against the incorporation and in the editorial, saying it wouldn't work. Sure mm. 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 There's still time there, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think most of the people around this table have done everything they can to make sure they're wrong. So. We appreciate that. One concern I have is down the line in the articles that you have, documents, are they being preserved in archival manners Abs at all? Absolutely not. I mean, they are in her basement, which is as dry as a bone, so. Um, are they categorized? I mean, could you go find in this box that you went through put in that room. If somebody said, I want to see the article on why, will you know what box and what page and what folder it's in? I um, think that's the we, we don't get down that far, but yeah, pretty much so. I mean, the boxes are labeled and and then they're in folders that are labeled inside the boxes. So yeah, it, it wouldn't be ter I mean, and Pat more so than I has been through these numerous times. So. She, and she has a very good memory, better than mine. Um, she could probably go to them pretty quickly. Just knowing how newspaper can disintegrate rather rapidly, you would yes. worry about the ability to have a later. Well, some of these are 25 20 years, years old, old. Yeah, 20, almost 25 years old now, and currently they're in excellent shape, so. I mean, I don't know, if you go another 25 years in a basement that they still will be, but for right now they are. And I think, you know, the, the goal is to get it all archived eventually so it's on digital media, you know, but that's going to be a pretty lengthy process and it probably needs to be pared down even more to, to do that. But. A lot of the stuff that Don had is background material that they used as they prepared the plan of intent. They looked at the financial situation and where the, you know, where the money was going to come from and how much it was going to be and comparing this city's government with what kind of government do we want to set up and, you know, that, I don't know that all of that needs to be archived. but. But there is a considerable amount of information there that does need to be archived, I think. To the commission members, the city is kind of a bystander on this particular matter because we didn't own any of the articles. They were collected by private individuals as part of a for-profit or private entity. So we can only archive them or preserve them as the city if they're donated to the city. And if, they, if people do not want to do that, there's nothing we can do to require them. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Um, the work
program for Historic Route 66 promotion. It's not ready for action now. Right. And uh, we're making heads on. We are, because it is on our work program. <laughs> are there any other items that anyone has that they need to bring up tonight? We have one item that was placed at your chairs tonight, um, Mr. Hildebrand, which was a site visit we did approximately one year ago on the Lindy Lane, has filed for the demolition permit. So that is proceeding forward. The block that formed the little outbuilding structure has been recovered by the city and it is in storage. And so Mr. Hildebrand met the requirements of the commission. So we'll be issuing the demolition permit. As Kathy mentioned, the next meeting will be December the 5th. That's the first Thursday of December. And there will be no other meeting at the end of the month. So it'll be a long time between December 5th and third week, fourth week of uh, January. I have no other closing remarks. Thank you, everyone, for all your input tonight. It's all very, very valuable. Moving forward. Have a nice Thanksgiving holiday. Move that we close. Or second. Second. Third. All those in favor of that? Thank you all again. Appreciate it very much. Thank you guys. I'm going to make a choir practice. I'll be late.